the order tonight is going to be Christelle, Jessica, Juby, Kaki, and Tiana. So first up, um, I am pleased to welcome Christelle Victoria Roach. She's a writer born and raised in Miami, Florida. Uh, she's an MFA candidate at the University of Miami studying poetry. She graduated from Emory's class of 2019 with a Bachelor of Arts degree in Creative Writing and African American Studies. Her research interests primarily center Black women, focusing on their images and voices as a rejection of society's historical and cultural lenses, which too often omit and obscure their contributions. Christelle is a poet and playwright, but she sees research as comprehensive storytelling. She's currently working on her first book, Bluesing, as her MFA thesis, which she looks forward to sharing with her community and beyond in 2022. Please welcome uh, Christelle Victoria Roach. Hi, thank you. I'm so honored to be here and to share this space, this virtual space with all of these amazing poets um, and to share some, some, some new work. Um, I'm excited to share. Um, it's primarily um, stories or just poems about Miami, the place I've born and raised in um, that I love. And so this is a poem for um, a family friend who was lost this a couple months ago um, due to gun violence. Another mango season for Arrington. He lays with the softness of a woman in slumber beneath the white sheet. His feet slump like sodden banana leaves. This year, the tree only gives dead fruit. A soil born disease ripples across the leaves and trunks like acid rain, like blood. The folks at the stoplights sell blood oranges and spiced mango, while a woman who lost her son views his body, leaves her baby beneath the borrowed sheet. She hands out water and fruit snacks to the children who can't leave their mothers to rot with the belief that death is a home going. Defy bloods plays in the living room while outside the fruit trees bend with caution tape. All the women wear black like skin, they sit heavy as bed sheets, wondering about fruit, peaking, fruit picking, how leaves changing once marked seasons, but now leaves a metaphor for the wake. I grab a handful of leaves. A boy kneels on a bed of weeds thick as a sheet. His mother drifts in daylight. She dreamt of blood all June. We arrive with evening and womanhood twists my gut with the smell of still strange fruit. What to make of the tree who claims to bear fruit? There's no ripened skin here, only dead leaves and there are bodies in the street. All summer, the women watch the fruit fall into elegies. The leaves, an involuntary metaphor, shine with the blood that painted the house, the porch, the street. The sheet has known bodies too that found blood in sleep. I try not to think of sheets colored fresh. I too pick up a crate of water and fruit snacks. Each hand that meets mine hides the blood beneath skin. By nightfall, the heat of the day leaves the smell of overripe fruit. We taste the release. Each one of us watch the woman as she sways, mourning like a woman in love. She moves with the trees, leaves us wondering about the metaphor of leaves. And I will also read um, another poem it's another Miami poem, um, but this is kind of about Everglades, family history, and childhood memories. Um, so, Elegy for the Gladesmen. In the wake, the past that is not the past reappears, always, to rupture the present. Christina Sharp. As a girl, I learned the Everglades age through decades of death. I recall this knowledge in the field, the same trip I took 11 years ago, when I learned not to test the water, to see if it would snatch me into a death row or squeeze me like a whisper. High tide is a time to return, a secret held by locals. When the water rises, I am made into a child again at its mouth. No motion in this lifeless body, save for the black shadows lurking beneath the surface, still as memory. In the wake, I see the boy remove his sneaker, ease his toes to the water's surface. I watch with envy. The mouth opens. He dances his toes like a man discovering, pioneering. He will speak of this moment as a victory someday. I know better than to let the water remember me. 
Skin of my kin was once out here, their toes wrought with fungus, the same that ate the mango trees and cotton. I watched the boy's white feet shine through the water clear. I relent with the frustration of a child, determined to prove I can dance and discover and be seen too. I slide my naked foot into the water, feeling a pulse in my soul. The boy laughs at my blended foot, undetectable. He says, no one remembers the dirt and speaks of his forefathers, gladesmen, sawgrass cowboys, who belonged as much as the Seminoles. The, they rode atop the water on airboats and tractors, their blades ripping through water and skin, clearing as they followed colored foot soldiers. I remember the elementary drive to the wetlands and the sky old as ancestry. At the entrance, entrance to Flamingo, a tree is upturned, roots exposed to the whipping sun. I want to tell the boy the stories my daddy told me about all our greats who lived here with the water, free before and after slavery. They found work draining the glades and hunting pink bullworms. I want to tell him how dark this water is, how people make game using children to pry the water open, to reveal the creatures they called predators. Had I been born at high tide, near the cusp, I would have been baited for breath. No doctor for chump change in water stained cash could have saved me. I learned to fear the water, not only for what it holds, but also for the photo ops, heroes, and culture it makes of cowards. The white boy in my fourth grade history class whips out a photo quick as a tongue, showing one of his greats holding a gator bound at the jaw. Everyone runs over to hold the photo in the light. My foot remains wet in the distance, a ripple. A sinkhole opens its mouth beneath my foot. I fear quickness might get me stuck or draw attention and I'd fall into the gaping mouth. A figure creeps nearer to me while the teacher snaps a photo of the great grandson of a gem. My mouth fills with water and the taste of blood as I grind my teeth. There are no photos of my gladesmen, no bodies to call a hero, to name after the water. I've seen the photo before. It was the proof I didn't have in the classroom that we made Miami a home generations ago. In the background of the photo, a man leads the swamp buggy. The photo mistakes his skin for a shadow. He remains nameless. A legend shared from mouth to mouth his face, a memory only to his children who called his name when the water rose. They splashed like chum when they turned their backs to the deep and kicked their feet gator bait. The water swallowed them like a sinkhole. Who writes the history for the people, water lost, dead even to history? When a classmate sees the gator crawling beneath the water after my body, my name is called spoken among the local heroes. Eyes wide, I wait for the choir of onlookers to say it again before I wake with the water as it breaks for the body and we all run, having formed a shared memory. I pedal my foot with a quickness before I too become a legend. Thank you. Thank you so much, Christelle. That was, as I said in the chat, that might be the most Miami poem I've ever heard. That was so gorgeous. I love that. Thank you, thank you. Um, next up, uh, we have another Miami poet, Jessica Machado is a poet and artist from Miami. She is a reformed guerrilla poem writer for hire, which I was there in the days when she was a guerrilla poem poet for hire. Uh, she teaches literature and history to high schoolers, and she loves the Miami Heat. Here, here to that. Please welcome Jessica Machado. Hi, thank you so much for being here, everybody. And um, it's great to see all of you. Thank you for coming and listening. Um, so uh, I always get nervous at these things, so I'm just going to do a tiny poem just to sort of like get my nerves out. I think the poem title is longer than the poem. Actually, it is. I'm looking at it. So this is also a very Miami poem. Um, I hope that some of you um, know this place. It's a famous local haunt called Fox Sharon's Inn uh, near the University of Miami. 
it's no longer here. Um, so in a way it's, you know, kind of an homage to that place. So it's, it's titled to the empty stool next to me at Fox's Sharon Inn. You are full of possibility. I told you it was tiny. So that's that poem. I like to write in bars in both senses of that word, you know? So I, and it's, and it's true. That's like, these are the, these are the little things I write on like on the backs of like, you know, like uh, napkins and coasters and whatever I can find receipts. Um, but I would like to now do um, a new one for you. Is does any poem count, written during this year count as a pandemic poem? Even if it's not about the pandemic? So if if that's a criterion, this is a pandemic poem. And so I call it, um, for at least now, it's a new, very new poem. It's called A Poet Considers Her Craft. In the best gardens, the cure grows next to the poison, but I am a haphazard gardener. Salvias vie with the nightshades, baonias and belladonic lurk, manioc and nightshades, nightshades run the yard. And slightly off center, the stand of arecas creak under the glorious weight of the vine, gun de amor. It's spiky sunburst fruit when cultivated, a remedy for sweet blood, heartbreak, and amagura is called bitter melon. But the buntings love the sticky scarlet seeds mushroomed forth like spent hollow point bullets, and the bees too love the flowers, but the vines and tendrils strangle their fronds. Do I hack through this unruly mess? It's so warm and there's this tightness around my throat like a wet wool turtleneck in August. Forgive me, I can only speak for myself in animal terms. But I know husks crumble beneath. I see also new growth from the areca's exposed roots jutting from their burden. Is this burden its ligature or its mantle? Thanks. So I want to end on a more positive poem, more lighthearted poem. Also kind of, I think in a way, a pandemic poem, because I've been seeing recently, like on social media and, you know, and, and just weird little signs, like um, this appreciation for Bob Ross, right? Do you know the painter on PBS, Bob Ross, with a, you know, big fro, you know, kind of like mine? Um, and there's been a real appreciation for him during the, the pandemic, I think because he's comfort food in some ways. And, but I've appreciated it for a very long time. So this poem actually goes back to like 2007. And it's titled In Defense of Bob Ross, not because Bob Ross needs defense, right, from any of us currently, right? He's a bomb. But because when this kind of poem, this, this kind of sprouts from an incident when I was a girl, my, my grandfather was a painter. And he was an, uh, a well-regarded academic painter. He painted it in oil. He painted classical landscapes. I mean, this was the, the pinnacle of like European style landscape painting, right? But he loved Bob Ross and was one of our rituals. You know, before we would go into the studio, we'd have lunch and we'd have a little TV and we'd watch Bob Ross. And then he'd go into the studio and he would paint. And I one day I asked him, I was like, why do you like Bob Ross? And so... While this poem is in my voice, it's in a way his answer to me. So in defense of Bob Ross, thanks for listening. It's just too easy to pick on the bushy fro and hippie camp counselor beard. So he looks like Walt Whitman and Boom Boom Washington's love child. He knows his cadmiums from his Indians dark sienna from Alizarian crimson. I can forgive his happy little clouds and happy bushes and little trees in need of strong daddy trees because he's right. 
Even a little tree needs a friend. I paint along each week. Little sack green bushes and happy yellow ochre and phthalo green trees line paths going nowhere in particular because it's my world. I especially like mountains. The tisk 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 of our artist knives against our palettes, mixing their substance of midnight black, Van Dyke brown and titanium white. You decide how many peaks and bumps live on your mountain, he says, because you can create any kind of mountain you want in your world. Thanks for listening. Thank you so much, Jessica. That was beautiful. Um, next up, we have Juby Ariola Headley. Juby is a Black queer poet, storyteller, and first generation United Statesian who lives with his husband in South Florida and whose work explores themes of manhood, vulnerability, rage, tenderness, and joy. He's a 2018 PEN America Emerging Voices Fellow, holds an MFA from the University of Miami, and his poems have been published with Ambit, Beloit, Nimrod, Southeastern, Humanities Review, The Nervous Breakdown, and elsewhere. Juby's debut collection of poems, Original Kink, is available now from Sibling Rivalry Press. Please welcome Juby. Thank you so much, Scott. Uh, thank you so much for inviting me. It's an honor to read at the invitation of O Miami, and it's absolutely an honor to read with these amazing poets. I'm gonna issue an apology to Christelle, who I had the joy and wonder of being in a workshop with at the University of Miami last year, um, because she has heard and helped me workshop um, at least one of the poems I'm gonna read. So it will be somewhat familiar to her, but she said she liked it. So hopefully y'all will too. I am gonna read two poems from Original Kink. And if there is time, I'm going to read a third new poem that I have written during the pandemic um, in the past few weeks, actually. Uh, the first poem I'm gonna read is Peacocking. And I think the best way to describe this came to me through another poet. He read it and he was somebody who was privy to reading the entire collection. And it became the first poem in the book because he said, it's my thesis statement. And that rings very true to me. So that's what this poem is. It's kind of the thesis statement of original kink. And it's called Peacocking. You a boy, right? It's this silly game I play with myself, scavenging for scraps of conversation out of context, like peacocks in the Arctic or tenderness expressed in baritone. And here in this department store, like every other, I'd found it, a single word, sharp and swift to Fisher, boy. Perhaps the boy had stared too long at the man behind the cosmetics counter. Gothic arches penciled in where eyebrows once grew. Perhaps the boy had lingered, longing, lusting, fingered the fabric of some skirt or blouse as the man I can't imagine is his father whisked him through the missus section. This boy, broken, his stride, his spirit. While some woman, I can only imagine the boy called mother guided her gaze toward anywhere but this moment. She's long seated hope for something soft in the boy. I wish I didn't know the rest of his story, how butterflies won't so much settle in a boy's belly as slit their own throats for fear of flamboyance. How a boy must fashion his fists into ciphers for touch. How quick we are to teach a boy to cradle his hurt in his hands and preen. So that's peacocking. The second poem I want to read you, um, I wrote on Easter Sunday 
and it's much less somber than that poem. I consider this a joyous poem. We'll see what y'all think when I read it. It is called Superhero Origin Story. It's Easter morning, and though I hear I'm as likely to catch hell as be saved if I cross a church threshold, I find myself tripping over five young girls, not a one yet 16, belting right on King Jesus. To my mind, the blackest hymn ever played. And oh, my sweet children, if you could just hear how those four sopranos and altos, a pair of each, race each other up a sainted ladder of notes and half notes, aiming not to reach the heavens, but by grace to blast open heaven's door. So as for all of us to great taste a minute of that great getting up morning, while the fifth sister does the yeoman's work, holding that bass line steady, making sure that ladder don't so much as wobble and as if on cue the firmament above me commences to burst and spill forth all over this green and gray earth and a simpler man might have thought this some rogue omen, some bad juju, but I have seen the song that rain brings and for a moment, for one infinite instant, I think my own tears are done with down and falling upward like my open palms to meet the rain for a hallelujah. And as I moved myself to twirl, to spin, to wail the words, ride on King Jesus, no man cannot hinder me. I'm quick corrected by a neighbor. It's thee, not me. I'm not so sure, friend. I hear that song, that unending crescendo. Feels like I'm the one who's unbreakable. So that is two of three poems. And I think I do have some time left. This last poem I wrote very recently, um, but I love to share new work um, with you. So I'm going to, despite the fact that nobody else has seen this yet. Um, I am calling this one very simply and many poets have written poems with us the same title. I'm calling this one Ars Poetica. And I wanna also say this is the first time I've read it publicly. So for y'all. Ars Poetica. You climb the ladder to the top of the slide, hover there, afraid to flow. You wish you were a different kind, a boy who knows the thrill of closing your eyes, letting your arms snake out to the ice blue sky, catching your high head voice, battling the wind whistling past your ears, all sound and fury signifying too many things. You are too many things. Child, ain't nobody up in here trying to be Shakespeare. The trick of it is not to care about where or how you stick the landing or whose shins you take out in the process. All you got to do is let gravity do its thing. And yeah, crashing hurts like any childhood will do, but trust you me, it's the only way through. Let go. Thank you all so much. Thank you, Juby. That was beautiful. Thank you so much for sharing your work with us. That's, that's like truly a gift. That was an incredible poem. So now we, we are to our two featured readers this evening. Uh, or our first of our two featured readers. Um, next, we have Kaki Wilkinson. Kaki is the author of the poetry collection Circles Where the Head Should Be and the Winona Stone Poems. Recent work of hers has appeared in The New Yorker, The Nation, and Kenyon Review. And her third collection, The Survival Expo, uh, will be published this June. And she lives in Memphis, Tennessee, where she joins us. Uh, please welcome Kaki Wilkinson. 
Thanks guys for coming. And oh my gosh, Christelle, Jessica, Juby, those poems were awesome. They were amazing. I'm so happy to read for you guys and um, really excited to read with Tiana too, who I, it's my neighbor down the road in Nashville, but um, who we've never, we've never met before somehow. So um, I'm gonna read poems from my third collection, The Survival Expo, which is coming out in June. You, it's available to pre-order now if you want to order it. Um, I'm just going to start with a few poems from the beginning of the book, and then um, I'm going to read some from the end of the book, too. Uh, but this is the very first poem in the book, and um, it's called Jocks. The back row in American history, already wearing away uniforms under our warm-ups, popping purple gum, some of us in lipstick stolen from our mothers, others mistaken for our younger brothers with buzz cuts, cornrows, jacked up ponytails. We didn't care about the presidents. We cut out early in a seamless blitz of nylon sheen. Our thighs were staggering, our stretches legendary, counting four, five, six. We swore we saw the bleachers flinch. We licked our palms and rubbed our sneakers clean and couldn't stand the Pentecostal teams with their set shots and culottes. What was worse than modesty? And who could top our coach, destroying clipboards, screaming, get your man, whose fury was the only compliment we'd ever trusted. Most of us believe that suffrage meant collective suffering. We weren't discerning, but we weren't unsure. Our trick plays worked. We wore each other's sweat. Our pregnant captain didn't know it yet. So um, <laughs> this is the, I'm, I'm reading just from the very, very beginning. So this is the second poem in the book and it, uh, there's a series that once runs through this book where that features a, a character named Hope, um, who is the speaker's cousin, the speaker of these poems. And the, these poems are kind of sprinkled through the book. Um, so this is the first of that series. It's a prose poem. It kind of sounds prosier. Um, but the title alludes to Allen Ginsberg's amazing uh, poem, A Supermarket in California. Um, at one point, Ginsburg was in this poem, but then I cut him out. So, <laughs> but he survives in the title. So uh, this is a supermarket in California or a supermarket in Tennessee, rather. <laughs> the morning after, my cousin Hope won $200 for beating the crap out of a woman on stage at Blanchard's. I went to Kroger. I used to worship her, older, taller, tougher, my very own ego's fog machine. But there I was, freezing my ass off while I looked for what she needed. It'd been a week of new laws, Headlines reading, wine and groceries, guns on campus, both sides still buzzing, righteous, neither one appeased. Hope called to say her eye was swollen shut, and who was I to judge? Hadn't I huffed my share of duster? Didn't I make a boyfriend sexy magnets of me in hot pink underwear and different outfits he could change? He stuck them on his mini fridge, and there is no telling who all saw, but even then I knew I'd never run for office. Hope took the pictures for me. This was before I left for college, before the Kroger was a Kroger, just a rundown store where Hope got caught stealing blueberries. My mother said that was the moment things went south, as if someone suddenly starts stealing blueberries. I want to claim I haven't been unkind, there is so much that mortifies us later. I don't think about what happened to those magnets. I don't think about the students I should arm myself against. Who knows what's worth $200 once you're six drinks in at Blanchard's. They call it foxy boxing. Hope's face was puffed up worse than I expected, but of course I lied and said it wasn't bad. I bought her what she wanted, a box of white and ice. As kids, our favorite game was diner. I cut and glued the menu's paper food and when we'd spend hours taking orders. 
So I live in Tennessee. There's a, there's kind of a, a, a nice split where we've had the Miami poets and now we have the Tennessee poets, but Tennessee has uh, some very weird town names. And um, for a while, I, I mean, I grew up in Tennessee. I've basically lived here my whole life, except for a few, um, few years here and there. But uh, I've been cataloging these names for a long time. And um, I always pass through Buck Snort on my way to, <laughs> to, to visit family in Middle Tennessee. But um, I've been thinking about these town names for a while and uh, trying, trying, thinking about how they're sort of evocative. So after the 2016 election, I wrote this poem. And it's, it's made up entirely of town names. So it, I hope that as you start to listen to it, it will it will take on a kind of resonance, but there's no, um, there's no sentences in the poem, it's just a list, but it's called Flyover Country between Memphis and Bristol. So the, the west side of the state and the east side of the state. Flyover Country, Turtle Town, Cotton Town, Reagan Town, Trade, Pigeon Forge, Coal Field, Hurricane, Gray, Huntersville, Fisherville, Manlyville, Guys, Static, Gentry, Difficult, Bride, Shackle Island, Bone Cave, Pioneer, Swift, War Trace, Nixon, Ransom Stand, Gift, Barren Plain, Nameless, Cherokee, Pope, Campaign, White House, Purdy, New Hope, Bug Scuffle, Speedwell, Tazewell, Yell, Brick Church, Hanging Limb, Burnt Church, Bells, Little Lot, Buck Snort, Bitter End, Boon, Need More, Prospect, Liberty, Moons. Let's see, I'm trying to, it's okay. I'm gonna read one more of the Hope poems and then I'm gonna skip forward a little bit. Uh, this, this poem mentions Elvis Week, which if you are not a, a, a Memphian or <laughs> is the, is, it usually happens in the middle of August. It's on the anniversary of Elvis's death, which is August the 16th. And um, it's a whole week of events in Memphis surrounding Elvis at Graceland and um, other places in Memphis, lots of tribute bands lots of Elvis impersonators. Um, it's always really, really hot. Um, so that's the scene of this poem. It also mentions Elvis's logo, which you might not know, uh, is it, it's like TCB with a lightning bolt, TCB in a flash, um, taking care of business is what, <laughs> what TCB stands for. So this is, this is Hope Comes to Elvis Week. We go to Graceland for the vigil. Hope in the same fuchsia tube dress she wore to our grandpa's funeral. But it's okay this time around. Nobody hissing about what's appropriate. Not in Memphis in August, 99 at dusk, the dew point making people's hair deranged. We clutch our little candles from their cardboard cuffs and mine keeps going out. Hope leaning over to relight it. There are as many Elvises as Elvis fans, old and not so old and from the farthest reaches, rolling strollers, luggage, oxygen tanks, so many stick on sideburns, so many ways to sweat. I don't know it yet, but hope's blurred out on pills again. We both buy buttons with the lightning logo, taking care of business in a flash. One too tall Elvis strums a ukulele, rolling up and down the line along the gates and nodding solemnly. The crowd just slightly hushed. Hope says, can you imagine being loved this much? All right. I'm gonna do two more. Is that good? That's, I've been trying to watch. Oh, okay. Uh, so this is, this is maybe the newest, the, new, the newest poem um, in the book. Um, and it's uh, it's called it's called some importance we ignored. It um, is kind of thinking about how we things have been feeling apocalyptic. We've been using that word a lot lately, and sort of looking at some of the smaller 
maybe less obvious signs we might have ignored. It's also a poem that is kind of an absidarian poem, a poem that moves through the alphabet, but it moves through backwards. So if you hear that, that's what's, that's what's happening. Some, some importance we ignored. It wasn't just the zebra mussels or the Zumba zealots. There were Yorkies and yin yang earrings. There was the year of the Yankee candle, your yes to the yard of ale. There was Xanax weather, wipers wagging off track the whole way back from the world's biggest fish fry. There was the world's biggest fish fry and the VP vowing, you were very valuable in these uncertain times. We all had an uncle who was into UFOs. There was talk of tardigrades. There were turtles on the train tracks. We took time off for swamp tours and sexy gun range selfies. We had developed resting Roquefort face, quibbling about queens and what counts as a quorum, though we paid no mind to pet portraits or overpass or oracles. Our national pastime was the power nap. Our mattresses sagged, our mustard was moldy, and little by little looked like less and less. The junior league ladies kept knocking back kombucha. Everyone wanted a jet ski or jacuzzi. There was infighting at information services. Our handy men were hardcore hagglers and hamstrung. We greeted the gods of the ground floor. There was funk and fury in the air ducts. We were feeling, even then, the effects of the ecstasy. We were deep into dubstep, still connecting the dots about the death of fuzzy dice and fruit cocktail, still sloshing cold brew on our crotches. There was the cult of cauliflower. There were dropped calls from the Tower of Babel, bats in the attic, American air balls. There was an abattoir for every arc and always some backwards answer, an amen after all we hadn't asked. All right, this is the last one I'm gonna read. Um, this is a, a poem that is, it's also the title poem of the book. Um, and it's also the name of a convention that I went to in Memphis a couple of years ago with a friend of mine. Um, it was called the Survival Expo and Gun Show. I decided to leave that part out of the title, the title of my book and this poem, but um, it was a gathering of people um, and vendors who were interested in um, kind of extreme doomsday prepping. And so there were lots of weapons and vats of food and things like that. Um, so that's that's the scene. <laughs> that's the scene of this poem. Um, it was it was unsettling, and it was also this was like two years ago, so it was pre-pandemic. But it in some ways now feels oddly prescient. Um, so this is called the Survival Expo. It's mostly men inside the Agra Center, pricing seed vaults and metal shelters, knives and MREs spread over dressed-up tables like alms for fraught apostles take, eat. And we expected this, my friend and I, but came in anyway for fun, I guess, except to me it feels a little like a test to prove how out of place we aren't, which I'll acknowledge is a flaw of mine, this tendency to double down pretending things are fine, a tactical response. Like when my friend tells me she's feeling better and all I do is compliment her hair how thick it's growing in, how glad I am. Before I train my focus on the man selling disaster rations meant for pets, taste tested, he explains, on cats, since dogs will eat whatever, but cats are, er, yeah, but cats are picky bastards. And see, his pack will hold a month's supply. And here's a pocket for your gas mask. And here's a pamphlet about chemtrails too. But it's the truth, we're sorely unprepared for even minor hazards, acts of God and whatnot. Living as we do along a semi-dormant fault in Tennessee, our billboards lit with shot theology and ads that flash, yes, silencers are legal. So I can understand why there's a line for 20 minute background checks. This being a thoroughly American response to background checks and fear compared to, say, the Middle Ages, how King Charles VI 
believing he was made of glass, sewed iron bars into his clothes and hardly moved and wouldn't let himself be touched, so scared of shattering, which just goes to show the kingdom of the self will always be the hardest to defend. I wonder what he'd think to see us probing superior illumination, lamps that burn for 40 days and charge your phone, something my friend could use, she tells me, texting a picture to her husband who responds, I think you ought to leave the Agra Center. But then we get distracted by these tools with punch out from punch out cards that fit inside your wallet. So if you're stranded in the wilderness or captured and have access to your wallet, you might still save yourself. What can it hurt, we say, and stand there for a while comparing options, snare locks, fish hooks, saw blade, handcuff shim because you never know what you'll walk into and the agri center smells like kettle corn and my friend is feeling better, done with chemo and I don't know what to say, but can't shut up. Just keep reloading wrong words through the last packed aisles and turnstiles back to Saturday. Appalled, of course, but not ungratified by all these ways we have to stay alive. Thanks, y'all. Thank you so much, Kaki. That was incredible. Amazing, amazing stuff. So our final reader this evening is Tiana Clark. Tiana is the author of the poetry collection, I Can't Talk About the Trees Without the Blood from the University of Pittsburgh Press, which won the 2017 Agnes Lynch Sterrett Prize and Equilibrium from Bull City Press, directed, selected by Alpha Michael Weaver for the 2016 Frost Place Chapo competition. Clark is a winner uh, of the 2020 Kate Tufts Discovery Award, a 2019 National Endowment for the Arts Literature Fellow, a recipient of a 2019 Pushcart Prize, a winner of the 2017 Furious Flowers Gwendolyn Brooks Centennial Poetry Prize, and the 2015 Rattle Poetry Prize. She teaches creative writing at Southern Illinois University at Edwardsville. Please welcome Tiana Clark. Hey, I'm so excited to be here. Can everyone hear me all right? Great, um, this is such an incredible lineup. It was so wonderful to hear you, Christelle, Juby, Jessica, and Kaki. And thank you so much to Scott and Caroline and Oh Miami um, for curating this wonderful night. And thank you all for attending. I see some friendly names. And, and the list. Um, Kaki, I want to write a Kroger poem now. Um, that's incredible. Uh, I'm going to start with a poem that recently came out. Um, I was telling the panelists before we started, um, I don't normally write about nature, um, but this poem kind of slipped out last summer in the thick of the, the pandemic summer. Um, I stare at a cormorant. I stare at a cormorant with its waterlogged wings spread open drying off on a rock in the middle of a man-made lake after diving for food. And it makes me think about wonder and it makes me wanna pry and stretch my shy arms open to the subtle summer wind slicing through the park, sliding over my skin like a stream of people blowing candles out over my feathery body. And it makes me think about my church when I was a kid and how I lifted my hands to Jesus, hoping for surrender, but often felt nothing except for the rush of fervent people wanting to be delivered from their aching present pain and how that ache changed the smell in the room to money and how I pinched my face, especially my eyes tighter, tighter and reached my hands higher. How I, like the cormorant, stood in the middle of the sanctuary so exposed and open and wanted and wanted so much to grasp the electric weather rushing through the drama of it all like a shout in the believer's scratchy throat. I don't go to church anymore. But today I woke up early and meditated. I closed my eyes and focused on a fake seed in my hand and put my hands over my heart to shove the intention inside my chest to blossom. I'm still stumbling through this life hoping for anyone or someone to save me. I'm still thinking about the cormorant who disappeared when I was writing this poem. I was just looking down and finishing a line and then I looked back up, gone. So 
So I've been writing these uh, long poems lately um, for my next collection. Uh, after the 2016 election, I felt really small in the world. And I found these ways that um, I wanted to take up as much space as possible. Um, and I felt that I could contain a type of lyric swagger and maybe be a little bit braver in my poems than I could in real life. I also love epigraphs, so shout out to anyone who loves epigraphs. Do you have any epigraph lovers in the chat? Um, if anyone tells you have too many epigraphs, this poem is for you. Broken Ode for the Epigraph, which begins with an epigraph from Erica L. Sanchez, which reads, who gave me permission to be this person? Oh, intertextuality. Oh, little foyer to my poem. Oh, little first and foremost, my amuse-bouche, meaning mouth amuser, a little glimpse of the meal to come. And if I could, I would add an epigraph over everything. Wait, who says that I can't? I've always been too much, and I'm just now beginning to cherish this too muchness booming Lake Baroque Rococo in my chest, little shells of scattered light decorating the caves in my poems. I wish people came with little epigraphs tacked on their foreheads, a little foreshadow couldn't hurt. I wish fruits had a few ripe lines above their blue numbers, a little sneaky peeky of the pulp to come. Oh, little cup holder for my quotes. I love how you hover over the house of my poem like a cloud from another book or a bite from another lover, a way to say, I just couldn't help myself here. See, I cut out these lines for you like fuzzy flower stems severed at an angle and they were briefly dead until I placed them in a vase on top of my poems, prolonging their life again, such moxie. Because if anything, the epigraph is a little clay container of water and I placed these blossoms in a vase of life juice because you are visiting the home of my poem. And I want you to feel special. And I think fresh cut flowers might make people feel sacriferous, at least they do for me. Especially when my mother-in-law walks barefoot into her gorgeous garden and snips the long lit stems from the sun bursting for Scythia bush, even though we haven't talked in months, even though I wrote a poem about her that hurt her, a poem that started with an epigraph from Natasha Trethaway. And we talked about it over email, then over coffee. And then there was forgiveness both sides. And that was it, see the flowers. I've always deeply loved Natasha Trethaway's work because her parents are like my parents, black mom, white dad, another type of epigraph, right? Do you understand what kind of permission that releases inside of me? Do you understand how cellular and specific? Sometimes it's important to know about the blood before the poem starts. Who makes up these rules about procedure anyway? I come from clutter. I feel safe under that little liminal space below the title underneath the stairs. And before that first line, Toy Derricott writes, I am not afraid to be memoir, yes. I feel a great affection for Toy Derricott because she has a familiar first name as my grandmother, but spelled differently. And also because she drew her beloved dead fish, Telly, and my copy of The Undertaker's Daughter, writing, Telly loves you with the bubbles and everything. Well, then I am not afraid to be the epigraph, damn it. I'm joyfully trying to break every rule about poem making that I know. I want to wake up and like myself more. I want to wake up and like myself more. I want to wake up and like myself more and believe it each time I repeat it. I want to revel in my poems the way Danica Kelly does. Have you heard Danica talk about poems do it absolute pleasure? I want more of that giddy precision. I want to wake up and address myself like the badass motherfucking epigraph that I am. Hello, epigraph! I am beginning my body before my body begins. I want to start my day with somebody else's words. For example, this morning, I started with Ross Gay's The Book of Delights, and I keep grinning and underlining words like delight radar and delight muscle and that image of stacking delights like pancakes. And I can hear Ross's voice as I read them, his joyous timber almost sings shouting inside these smile-inducing sentences, which linger over the blue length of my day. And I just got back from AWP in Portland, where I heard Jose Oliveira say, lean into length on a panel about poetry podcasts. I wrote it down and underneath his words scribbled, possible epigraph? Epigraph, a little foreplay, a little playful forest. I'm safe now so I can play. A little forecast of my mood and tone, a little incantation, little wordy satellites in the white spaces orbiting the sky parlor of my poems. Epigraph my father, epigraph my father I've never met, but how I meet and let him go at the beginning of every poem that I write. And isn't lost perpetually dripping sap from the injured trees, bruised or cut in our knuckles as we write. Sticky sap spilling from the wound, pitching to survive the bites. And aren't we all writing the same damn poem over and over again anyway? Didn't Jack Spicer allude to that once while translating Lorca? 
America. I want to go back to that first epigraph. The easy association will be God, right? So like this, God coos above the waters of the pre-world, scanning over all that gooey potential, a, bil a bajillion possibilities, millions of us already there, little epigraphs in the making, gleaming in that first sentence struck light. The imperative big bang of God's never ending breath. But, but what if that first epigraph wasn't so spectacular? What if it was just someone messaging me on one of those spit in a tube DNA ancestry sites, saying that they're my second cousin, saying that they know how to get in touch with my dad? Oh, the sheer possibility, I cried. Said that they'd give him my number and my email address, saying they told him I didn't want or needed any money, but how he still never reached out. So I don't normally do this, but um, I changed up my whole set list because I was inspired by Juby and, and Khaki. So I got some poems for you both. Um, so Khaki, when you're talking about Memphis, and then actually my friend Julia, who's in the chat, just texted me that you teach at Rhodes, which I didn't know. You know, I went to Rhodes my first year of college. Um, and actually my, fresh, my freshman year roommate is here in the chat. She knows a lot of secrets about me. And it's not easy to live with a poet, she can tell you. Uh, for one example, I remember she came, she, I had probably skipped class. I was having a rough year, okay? And I, she came into the dorm room and I think all the lights are off except for one spotlight was on me. And she was like, what are you doing? And I don't remember what I said. Maybe you can say what I said, Julia, but I said something very dramatic. Anyways, this is my, my Memphis poem for you, Khaki. Although when you hear the poem, you're probably, it's not for you in a sense, when you read it, you're gonna be like, oh, that's very intense, but you know what I mean? Just a place, a, lo a location. Delta, Delta, Delta. I don't know why I joined the white sorority. We whispered Latin passwords to each other. We wore white robes and sang to each other. I don't know where I belong. And the parties like pimps and hoes inside a rented laundromat with fake hickeys and scars on our skin and pimp juice and pimp cups. Look at me, the only black girl backing it up to Nelly, repeating, it's getting hot in here, so hot. So take off all your clothes. Grinding on washers and dryers, washers and dryers with my mom at the laundromat growing up, my fingertips collecting coins in between the slits and the couch, good treasure. The performance of being poor, the performance of playing the other while being the other, said Memphis, said sloppy weather. Didn't Jeff Buckley, didn't he die here drowned in some slack channel off the Mississippi River? Swimming with all his clothes on, said stay. They said stay off the streets with the names of presidents. They said that's where all the niggers live. Another said Memphrica. They laughed, not me. What hurts now? That I enjoyed the pretending? I still don't know who drew a thick dick on my face with a sharpie, didn't wash off for days, faint phallic outline, faint papyrus, another weak ghost, that I were white, that hardware of whiteness, that equipment, that apparatus, that privilege machinery felt good. So Juby, for you, I don't normally read new work, but in the spirit of vulnerability, hashtag Benet Brown, re-listening to Daring Greatly recently, I'm gonna read a new poem um, that's also called Ars Poetica. Um, so here we go. And what does it mean to write a poem about poem making anyway? I'm trying to not make everything about whiteness or half whiteness or any percent mixed with whiteness. And I disagree with Arthur Archibald McLeish and prefer Dorothy Alasky and Terence Hayes's take on the subject, re goodness and lighthead and bacon poeticas. And what does it mean to steer away from being too didactic? Aren't all poems instructive? I first wrote intrusive by mistake, but that could work too. Isn't every poem a teacher or intending to teach? Why do workshops sanitize risk? Why do most workshops start with what's wrong? I'll never forget when Robert Haas started our workshop at Swanee saying he wanted us to focus on wonder as our first inquiry. I remember how we all sighed and smiled like that first celebratory gasp of air at a poem that revels and reveals in something profound and precious to you. Like the first time I heard Lee Young Lee and Sharon Olds read aloud to me by my first poetry teacher, Bill Brown. I was 16 and new at poetry and knew nothing about poetry, but I remember something in that high school room shook me loose, popped and crushed me good like a shattered ball. I still find the shards everywhere I go. It was alchemic and personal. 
every fourth wall broke in me. I don't know how to name that beginning other than to say I'm still trying to get back there. I think for now I don't want or need your opinion about my work. I'm learning to trust and chase my own imagination and instinct inside a poem, which is my body, which is my breath, just this moment, just this breath, which is from my meditation this morning, repeating just this moment, just my breath, just this moment, just this breath, just this moment, just this breath. How am I on time, Scott? I don't, I don't even know. I'm okay. Okay. Um, Okay. Uh, do, do we have time for three poems or should I just do two? Three, okay. <laughs> um, my therapist wants to know about my relationship to work. Jessica, earlier you mentioned writing on receipts. So there's a line in there about this in here. You know, this was written before the pandemic. There, you know, all the busyness and hustle bustleness. So I, you know, I don't know what to say about that, but it's interesting to read this poem now in conjunction with that, but things have calmed down in my life. I'll just say that. I know how to take care of myself a little bit better. I hustle upstream, I grasp, I grind, I control and panic, poke balloons in my chest, always popping there. Always my thoughts thump, thump. I snooze, wake and go boom. All day like this, I short my breath. I scroll and scroll. I see what you wrote. I like, I heart, my thumb so tired. My head bent down, but not in prayer, heavy from the looking. I see your face, your phone lit faces. I tap your food two times for more hearts. I retweet, I email yes and yes and yes. Then I cry, I need to say no, no, no. Why does it take so long to reply? I FOMO and shout, I read, I never enough. New book, new post, new ping, a new tab, then another. Papers on the floor scattered and stacked. So many journals, unbroken white spines waiting. Did you hear that new new? I start to text back, ellipsis, then I forget. I bulk, I lazy the bed. I wallow when I write, I truth when I lie. I throw a book when a poem undoes me. I underline Clifton, today we are possible. I start from image, I begin with Phyllis Sweetly. I begin with Phyllis Sweetly. I begin with Phyllis Sweetly reaching for coal. I start with a napkin receipt or my hand. I muscle memory, I stutter the page. I fail, hit delete, scratch out one more line. I sonnet, then break form. I make tea, use two bags, Roy Boss again. I bathe now, Epsom salt, no books or phone, just water and the sound of water filling glory be my buoyant body bowl of me. Yes, lavender, more bubbles and bath bomb. Of course, some candles too. All alone with Coltrane, my favorite Naima for his wife, now for me, inside my own womb. Again, I child back, I float, I sing, I simple and humble, eyes close, I low my voice. Was it a psalm? Don't know, but I stopped. Let us never go back to that world <laughs> or just get therapy and learn how to manage your stress. That's what I did. I think I'm just gonna finish with one more poem. Um, this poem is uh, called 800 Days Libation. It's for Khalif Browder. Uh, I'm feeling as though this is a crowd. I don't need to explain Khalif Browder. If not, you can quickly Google it and figure it out. Um, but I, you know, after George Floyd's murder this summer, um, it's been very interesting to read this poem in conjunction with that. And it's been very interesting for me, the conversation that's been happening. And of course it was egregious, but at the same time for me, it was the same story, different neck. And I think there's something interesting when you're a black poet writing in this time and people ask you about your black pain and how you feel. Um, and it's this type, this, this type of bloodletting, this type of performance that I'm still trying to investigate and figure out how I'm responding to it and how to protect myself in that conversation. But I often feel that um, it starts for me in almost a place of negation. Like we don't wanna write that poem anymore. There's been so many elegies, right? Um, Cam Rockard Rich has a poem that says, elegy like and who am I to say rise because elegy is about resurrection and should we resurrect this body in a poem. Um, Toy Derricott wrote a poem this summer. Um, I can drop it in the, in the chat. Um, it was amazing why I don't want to write about George Floyd which I feel totally encapsulate what I'm trying to talk about um, and in the first couple lines because there is too much to say because I have nothing to say. Um, so I just want to hold those questions that I don't really know how to answer them in the air as I read this poem. And I just want to thank you all for your time and attention. 800 days libation after not wanting to watch time the Khalif Browder story on Spike TV. 
It rained inside me. It is raining inside my neck. The rain falls in sheets inside, long sheets inside. All the rain is falling inside, collapsing spit. I don't want to watch another black man die today or know the story of how he died today or how he was thrown away or how he ended up. I don't want to study the rain from inside the house or overhear wild rain swell and thicken, slap the roof with wet words in Khalif. Who was there when you stopped being and who was there when you were alone and beyond yourself? How the water around you from the island around you might have sounded like a chorus, who was there, who was there, who was there? And now everyone is watching your life from inside, but I'm afraid to watch them beat you. Watch torture throbbing dry and long with ache and blue black bruising, so I don't. And another black body is blown out, smoking wick, the lone wisp of a life linger, smelling burnt and gone. How rain wraps around a tornado is a type of sorrow because no one knows how to fathom damage inside someone's eyes could be the weather just after or before a storm. Calm and clear, but still bleaker inside the black parts of the pupils, the whole smooth black holes in the eyes as they left you in the hole with no rain. And I'm emptying a waterfall shouting, Khalif. I want you to be undead and not alone, lonely in the ground again. I want, I want, the, I want so much how it greeds like a fist of pounding rain on your body bleeding broke. But what I want doesn't matter. What I want are where blossoms for the dead because you're gone and your mother is gone. All because someone said you stole a backpack. Me and your body was made a forgotten altar. Your body made bodiless, kept pushing back as your child kept pushing back and back. And black matter moves backwards in time, meaning Khalif matters in the past tense, even though the space around your life didn't matter to them or them or them. Like the space that scatters and navigates around the circumference of raindrops is never wet and the braided distance between you and me is dry and long like time is rainless with a tight and loaded lungful blowing 800 candles out for the 800 days in solitary your brain behind bars fades your body in confinement your chest caged alone your body alone all I hear is your name falling and beating Khalif Khalif Khalif, 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 this is such a poor offering, but I'm pouring it on the ground like good rain. And whatever softens the earth is your name. Whatever might grow from that darkening bright spot is your name, lapping little lakes of creation, turning mud in your name. Whatever might be fed from the liquid raining inside me, whatever might be loosened from the muck and the dark rum pouring from my bottle. And Khalif, your name is drizzling a type of grief upon my mouth like mist as it rains inside me, as it is raining inside my body, the rain falls in sheets inside. All the rain is untangled and not touching. Who touched you? with the tenderness falling inside. And Khalif, what is there to say after so much rain? The ground is swollen with your name. Thank you. Thank you so much, Tiana. That was amazing. Uh, thank you to all the poets uh, for your words tonight. Uh, so incredible. Um, so we have uh, a couple questions in the Q&A. Um, so if you guys want to add one, if, you, if one came up, please do. Um, that's another thing I don't like about the Zoom reading. It's like normally you'd have that, that moment where the poet walks off the podium and then, you know, you can slowly walk up to the podium and it gives you this like breath, you know, like this like rhythm to it and you lose that. Um, I wish I had that right now. Uh, but our first our first question comes from Sarah Kersey, uh, who asked, Juby, I hope this isn't too big of a question, but how do you determine a thesis statement of a collection? Can a poet find it for themselves, or is it more readily evident to someone who is looking over your collection? And I'm gonna I'm I just wonder, gonna add everybody. Sorry, so everybody can see everybody. Just, sure. I wonder if that's a question from a poet who's putting together a collection. It feels like that kind of question. But even if it isn't, um, obviously we can take advantage of the fact that there are other poets here. So, you know, Khaki has a books, Tiana has a, a, a book out and a chat book. We could all talk about thesis statements. For me, my answer would be as I was putting together the collection, I thought about through lines and it was important to me to sort of have a thesis statement, but I hadn't thought of verbalizing it in that way until that poet said it to me. I think the answer to your question is um, that yes, it's both. I, I, I write in community, so sure, 
nobody can make me sit down at my laptop or write on my phone or take a pen to a notebook, but I'm always in conversation with other folks and I'm always sharing my poems unformed as they are with other folks. So other folks absolutely help you see what you're trying to do. And we could talk all night about what workshopping is or should or should not be or could be, but I have my own people that I go to with my work. And so I think I knew what I wanted to accomplish, but that's different than saying, this is the poem that sort of in a way defines what you hope your project is in the book. I don't know if that makes any sense, but other people weigh in, so I'll stop talking, please. Yeah, if anyone else wants to jump in on that one, uh, just jump in. Or I can go to the next question. <laughs> no pressure. <laughs> I'm, just trying to, I'm just trying to reread it. Sarah always asks the most brilliant um, questions, but they take me a minute to absorb. So I'm just trying to, I will say, I'll plug a book though that might be helpful for you, Sarah, and for other people that are putting together a collection. It's called Ordering the Storm. Um, I just found out about it, but it's a, it's a book of essays about putting together a collection. And there's a really great essay in there from Wanda Coleman, uh, where she sees um, uh, putting together a book as a distribution of energy, like a wave. And that really stuck with me. Um, can a poet find it for themselves or is it more readily ev evident to someone who is looking over your collection? You know, what I think when I hear a thesis statement, maybe that's so antithetical to me because uh, that makes me think of like the, the five paragraph essay, right? Which I try to very much um, distance myself from. But I think of a thesis as, as an argument, right? Or a sonnet as an argument. You're, you're, you're wrestling with um, a rhetorical question. And I think one thing that helps me, um, at least in equilibrium in my chapbook, one thing that Charles Baxter said to me is that he said every book, whether that's, you know, a short story collection, uh, link short stories, um, a novel, a book of poems, is um, wrestling with uh, an unanswerable question. And the protagonist or through the link of poems, you're, you're, you're trying to answer that question. Um, and you may never answer it, but that for me really helped for equilibrium, which, which the first poem ends with the question. And that became the narrative arc for me is that these poems are, are struggling with answering what is identity and who is the speaker and how are they handling race. So that became the arc for that poem. And I think for um, my full length collection, I, after I done the, I've done the chat book, you know, I think each poem teaches you how to write the next poem, each book teaches you how to write the next book. So I was like, well, I've done a chat book. Let me, and I was too massive to think about the big book. I was like, let me just think about three chat books. Um, and I think the thing of bookmaking, it's, it's, it's just like poem making. Yes, we have craft. Yes, all, we all could say prescriptive things to you, but there's this intuitive sense that we don't know what we know until we know it. Um, and we're just inside of it. And we take time and you have to like leave it alone and magical things happen. And you talk to your friends and you, you have moments of flow states and moments of frustration and the boat, but the book, just like the poem starts revealing itself to you. And if you're patient enough and diligent enough, which I know you are, Sarah, um, the collection starts coming together. You submit to deadlines, which siphons the book together and does something magical. Then when you don't get it, you go back to the book, you rearrange it again until it kind of clicks in place. And even when it's accepted, you mess around with your editor and the book again, morphs and morphs and morphs until a publisher is yelling at you that you have to now stop fussing with it. <laughs> um, and then you have to let go, you know? I don't know if that answered the question, but that's my take on it at least. Thank you, Tiana. Um, so we can go back to that one if, if anyone comes up with another thought, but the, the second question is from Jeff, who um, a line from Tiana's first poem went, I, I don't go to church anymore. And that kind of spurred a question uh, that he said is open to anyone, which is, uh, what do you no longer do in your poems that perhaps in earlier years you felt comfortable or confident doing? I just say really quick, I was scared where that was going, Jeff. So I was like, is this about, are you asking me about my faith? <laughs> my faith? And I was like, we'll have to talk privately about that. Jeff is a very dear mentor of mine. So I'm so happy you're here. Um, I'll have to think about this question. If someone else has something right, right away, I need to, I, this is a thinker tinker. These are thinker tinker questions today. I guess I'll say for me, I think that question in a, in a reverse, I'm actually like 
in that poem for me where I said, I'm trying to break every rule I know about poem making. I think there's things that I didn't do in my poems that I'm trying to do now um, where I think I was afraid to be too didactic. I was afraid to be too explainy in my poems. Um, and I actually think it's a craft move that I'm trying to articulate. Um, that I think of anything, I'm trying to be more of myself on the page where I think when I was writing, I felt like I had to be um, whatever a poet is. Uh, and I'm actually kind of unbreaking those shackles and doing and, and leaning into those things now, Leila Shetty has a really great poem about that too. I forgot, I'll, I'll try to find it and link it in the chat um, where she kind of uses, all the, she talks about stars, she talks about pomegranates um, and she kind of revels in it in a way that, and I, I do an exercise with my students sometimes. I'm like, what are all the rules that you've heard about poems? Write them all down. And I'm like, now I want you to use, break those all in a poem. And they, they write with such delight and such freedom as if they're free to be themselves. And, and to me, that's the place where I learned how to write from as a 16 year old and that a place that I'm trying to get to all the time. Yeah, I, I was unmuting myself as Tiana began to speak, and she said it so much more eloquently than I could have. And so I want to echo her, and I want to put it in terms that um, that I had to learn it. You know, so one day I was at a party with um, I was at Campbell McGrath's house. It was one of those parties in his backyard, and I don't know if you guys know who Campbell McGrath is, but he was one of my teachers at FIU. You're my Miami poet, you know who he is, and so you know I. You know, he, he, he asked me one of those pointed questions that you, you never want to hear as a poet. So how's the writing going? You know, are you writing? You know, like pointedly, just in my face right there and there. And I was like, well, you know, it's going okay. He's like, you know, I don't understand. You're such a good bullshitter. You can tell a story at a party like no one had ever fucking heard. He didn't say fucking. That's my embellishment. Like no one had ever heard. Where is that voice in your poetry? That's who you are. Just write that. Write your bullshit. You know? And it was like, it was one of those things where I was like, the force of this was just too much for me at the moment. I was like, I, I was just beside myself. And I did not understand the wisdom of what he was saying in this moment, but he's right. I'm a bullshitter. And my best poems kind of come from kind of knowing my voice and kind of trusting in that voice in a way, even if they're serious poems, right? It, it like part of my process is sort of roughing, it, it's sort of riffing in that sort of vein for a while until I sort of cast about and really sort of like figure out where I'm gonna dig deep and like really kind of go after like the meat of the poem but so that's my best way of echoing what Tiana said in my own way, you know, you said it more elegantly than I could have put it, but you know, but my version is be at home with, with who you are in, in my case, I'm a bullshitter. So thanks Tiana. I guess I can also hop in on that, that answer to this question. I think kind of an answer to Sarah's question, although I don't have a book. Yeah. Uh, um, so in thinking about um, what I don't do in my poems anymore, I think I'm in, in the process of undoing as I'm like working on my thesis for my MFA. Um, and I'm realizing like, I've heard people say, oh, oh, it's, you know, it's like a Christelle collection. If there's like black boy, somebody's mama in the blues. I'm like, I write about Miami, what are you talking about? But I, but the more people started telling me like this, like, oh, like people started pointing things out that I realized, oh, like, it's kind of like Edwige Danticat. She says that um, writing is like braiding and like you're taking coarse unruly strands and you're really working it in there. And I, and that's when I started to realize I had different strands to poems. Um, so I may be like, I'm gonna start out writing this. Like I was that person. So I, I guess the thing I don't do anymore is I don't go to a poem with like my little, this is what I'm gonna do. Um, my mom, when I was a kid, she used to say like, oh, if you wanna hear God laugh, tell him your plans. So I think that writing poetry is kind of like that, that you have to allow it to like happen. Um, and then also I had a mentor who really was just like, you're saying that you're doing something that you're not doing. And then I'm like, what are you talking about? It's so clear. But then I go back and I read the poem and I'm like, 
I'm writing an entirely different poem. And instead of trying to make it be the poem that I set it out, set out to be, like I kind of had to listen to the poem. I kind of had to listen to myself to see what I was writing. Um, and in that, I think that um, with the idea of a collection, I, I, the more that I like have this thing I'm sitting on, I get okay with it being like having those different strands. I get okay with it being a braid that that has oh this strand about that this strand about that this strand about that um and i think that people might have like people will definitely have their own thesis statement as to what they see in the poem um and i also think that where i start with a poem is probably never where i finish um but it's really interesting to see what comes back in a poem that's what i love um so with that, I, I, I'm just sitting here thinking about this writing and the process of it and the things that like I am actively learning. And I think that it's really creating space for the art to talk back to you, um, especially in like an oral tradition, especially in something where like I'm reading these poems out loud as I write. Um, I'm just like, wow, like, like I wanted to write this, but that's a whole different poem. And so I start saving stuff, you know, or that's a whole different collection, you know? Um, so I think that it, it's really important to listen to the poem that you're writing, listen to what, I don't know, to pay attention to what's happening on the page, but also to hold dear to what you set out to do um, because it just may not be happening here. Um, that's probably just a project for another day. And I think all of us writers are no stranger to projects and obsessions and things that come back. And all of that comes through in a collection, I believe. So we, we have time for two more questions. Uh, one is a quick one, which is, I, I would also like to echo this question, which is Tiana, which book does the epigraph poem live in? <laughs> I love it so much, uh, which is what Gabriella asked. <laughs> Thank you, Gabriella. Um, it's it's in my new collection that I'm working on now. It's not live yet. Hopefully soon, some news about that soon. But it's Tin House Online, and I'll I'll link it below for you all, so you can you can have the poem tonight, ready to go home, take take home the poem. But thank you so much. I'm um, uh, I'm excited that you that you want to see it again. Thank you. And then um, uh, Jorge asks, for anyone, uh, do you feel editing your poems waters down the original thought or emotion present when they were first written down? I find the more I edit, the more filtered they become, which I think is kind of a related question to some of the things we've been talking about, but, um, but also distinctive. I, I, would, I would say, no, <laughs> would be my answer to that. I mean, but I do think sometimes you can over edit. I have a tendency to over edit, to over tweak things. And um, it's the, you know, the analogy to art where you you miss mess with your painting so much that you ruin the, the original thing. And I, I understand that fear. Um, and I've definitely been guilty of doing that before. But <clears throat> I think more often for me, I sometimes realize the what the what's really driving the poem through editing. So there may be this initial emotion or this initial thought, and that's kind of a, a stepping off point. Um, but then through the process of editing, so you, you start to clarify kind of what you're getting at, or something that maybe is a subtext or or, or at least a little bit below um, below your understanding of what the poem is doing. And and so editing kind of helps you bring that to the surface. Um, but I mean, editing is is really tricky, and and just like Tiana was saying, you know, I have this this book that is, it, you know, it's been accepted for a, over a year now, and it's not coming out till June, and but we're in the final edits phase, and I'm still <laughs> going through and like changing these poems, and it's like, it, you know, my editor's like, give me the book, <laughs> like you cannot send me another draft of it, but um, there's this feeling I think with poetry maybe more than other kinds of writing that like you can get it almost perfect, even though I think that's really dangerous, but there's this idea that there's fewer words and you can get them, you know, you can get them almost exactly right. Um, and, and sometimes that can run, I think, maybe counter to the, the initial thing that makes us right, but it's always a balancing act. It's always a balancing act to try to figure out how, how much to push, how, how, how much pressure a poem needs. Well, 
Well, that was a fabulous answer. And I, th I think that's a good place to stop. Um, thank you, Juby, Jessica, Christelle, Kaki, Tiana. Thank you so much for being here and for contributing your words. Thank you to everybody who tuned in. Um, it, it means so much to us to, to have you here and listening and commenting. And it, uh, it, you know, this is kind of a lonely time and, and, you know, events like this make it feel less lonely. So thank you everyone. And thank you all the poets and please go buy their books, uh, support, support all the poets. All right. Uh, and with that, uh, I'll say good night to everybody. Thank you so much.